Now, at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus is there by the seashore with his disciples, and he, he starts a conversation with Peter, the chief of the disciples, and he asks him a threefold series of questions. Um, it's in verses 15 to 17. It says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, Feed my lambs. Um, then Jesus said again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter answers, Yes, Lord, you know that, you lo- that I love you. And Jesus says, Take care or tend my sheep. And then the third time, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter um, says he's hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And then Peter says, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. So feed my lambs, tend my sheep, tend my sheep and feed my sheep. Now, on the one hand, this is a, a scene that makes us think back to the time when Peter, on that night when Jesus was betrayed, when he was arrested and taken into the hands of the authorities um, in Jerusalem, how Peter followed along and in and, and that one evening denied Jesus three times and then went off and wept bitterly because his soul was broken by what he had himself done. And Jesus knows exactly what it's going to take for Peter to be reinstated, to be welcomed back into the the friendship that he had with Jesus, and for Peter to be able to go and live out the calling that Jesus is laying on on his heart. And so just as Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus um, helps him to remember three times the profound love that Peter has for Jesus. And at the same time, Jesus is giving Peter his marching orders. This is Peter's calling, right? Three times Jesus says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. It's this threefold calling to feed and tend and feed that Jesus lays on Peter's heart. And, and you know, Peter is the chief of the apostles. He says, do, Jesus says, do you love me more than these, right? Peter is the one who is centered, uh, drawn out for a special attention, But at the same time, I think it's Jesus giving this mission to all of the apostles and all of the church, including us, down through the ages. Um, You know, just as Jesus feeds us, we are sent out to feed Jesus' flock and to tend Jesus' flock. And that's what I want to help us here this morning, that Jesus calls us to feed others, the soul and body. And you know, last week we saw Jesus, he was on that seashore with the disciples, and we talked about how Jesus feeds us just as he fed the disciples that meal of bread and fish, a meal that was reminiscent of the Last Supper when Jesus broke bread and shared cup. Um, And and, you know, we don't want to get the the wrong idea, right? You know, Jesus feeds us so that we can go and feed others. We don't want to get the wrong idea. It's not like a a quid pro quo thing, right? It's not um, a transactional thing. Jesus feeds us, we feed others. Jesus feeds us because he desires to feed them. Because he desires that deep and loving intimacy that we call communion. But there's a way in which when we have been fed by Jesus, have broken bread and shared that cup with him, that we are just instinctually drawn to feed others. He says to Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. I know a little bit of something about feeding sheep. Um, When we were kids, we had sheep. And every morning, it was our job, me and my brothers, we had to go out and do chores, right? We had to pour a trough full of their their food, this mix of oats and these special pellets that smelled like molasses. And I was always kind of tempted to try them because they smelled sweet, but I never went through with it. But, you know, it was our job to to give them their oats and their pellets. And then we had to, you know, get a, in the wintertime, get a a bale of of hay down for them and, and make sure that their, their water was full in the water trough and make sure that the water heater was in there in the winter, you know. So it was this, this work that we had to do and we were carrying our buckets. It was like a little workout, right? And we had to feed the sheep. So I, I've done this. And I, I did, personally, I didn't, I didn't really like it very much, but we, we had to feed the sheep. And, you know, in this passage, if you look at verse 15, this strikes me as, as really important. Um, the way that the scene plays out is really important. You know, Jesus... He's just fed Peter and the other disciples. And that is, it says, when they had finished eating, right? So first he's fed them when they had finished eating. And then Jesus puts a question to Peter. 
And you know, this is really the way that Jesus operates, right? Uh, when, when, when Jesus, so often, rather than just telling somebody to do something, Jesus asks them a question. It's this kind of rabbinical way of teaching. And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And it could be read a couple of different ways. One is, do you love me more than these other apostles love me, right? You know, Peter, who is all in for Jesus, do you have a greater love than them? Or do you love me over those other apostles? It's a little bit, um, you know, ambiguous what he's saying. But do you have more love, right? Do you have this profound love for me? I don't think he's trying to knock those other disciples. It's, it's this question for Peter. Am I at the center of your life, Peter? And Peter, you know, Jesus, Peter, Peter says, yes, yes, yes. Right? He's kind of hurt that third time. And then Jesus gives Peter a threefold command, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. He starts with love, and then feeding the sheep is an act of love. Now, when we fed our sheep as kids, I'll be honest, it was not much of an act of love. Um, it was just something that we were told to do, so we had to do it. I mean, I guess, you know, I guess we had love for my dad. He told us to do it, so we did. But it was really an obligation, right? We had to get out there and make sure that the sheep were fed. We didn't have any particular love of those, for those sheep. Um, just something that we had to do. But not so with Peter. Jesus grounds loving, the sh loving him with feeding the sheep. Jesus is not going to be content to just tell Peter that it's his job to feed the sheep. Jesus wants to sort of motivate and drive Peter to do it out of love. He wants to see Peter root his ministry in this love that he holds for Jesus. Do you love me more than these? Then feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Now, Jesus isn't asking Peter to do anything more than what Jesus himself does. So back in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John, we see Jesus saying that he is the good shepherd. He says that as the good shepherd, he lays his life down for the sheep. He says that he came so that we might have life and have it abundantly. He says he has other sheep that he longs to bring into the fold. He says that his sheep know his voice and respond to him. So Jesus is always the shepherd of shepherds. He's the one that the book of Hebrews calls the great shepherd of the sheep. In Peter's first letter, Peter refers to Jesus as the chief shepherd. So Jesus cannot give up his role as chief shepherd. What Jesus is doing is giving Peter and others authority over the flock as under shepherds. But the flock always ultimately belongs to Jesus. The buck stops with Jesus. Now, in a way, what Jesus is doing is extending the shepherdhood to Peter, to the apostles, to the church, to us. Jesus is saying, look, I'm the good shepherd. I am the great shepherd. And I have this deep, deep love for all of the sheep. I want to feed the sheep. And I want you to be a part of it. I want to feed them through you. Jesus calls us to feed others. Now, the first thing this means is that we are called to feed the flock, and the flock is the church. We are called, especially when we're serving as leaders within the church, to care for the well-being of the church, to care for God's people. And you know, this is on our minds at the beginning of the year when we're, we're, we're figuring out who's taking on what role within the life of the church and, and getting our leadership teams together. And, and you know, I've, I've always, um, as, as a pastor, I've always got to make sure that I am feeding you something from the word, the, the goodness of the gospel, the sweetness of the bread and the cup poured out for you. I mean, but, but it's not just on me. All of us are in this together. You know, Paul, in his, his, letter to the first, his first letter to the Corinthians, he says that each of us has a special gift that we bring to the life of the church, and that it's with that special gift that we feed each other. We each do our part. There's also a missional aspect of this. So re remember this scene, right? They're there on the beach. He's on the seashore of the disciples. Jesus is outside of the walls. And I think there's something to that. We're, we're calling 2019 the year outside the walls. Jesus met those disciples outside the walls because he wanted to show them that their mission was not going to end at the walls of the synagogue or at the walls of the church church. 
They are sent out into the whole world. Their mission is to go to the lost sheep, to the wandering sheep, to those who don't even realize that they are sheep, and to feed them. And so if our first prayer as Christians is, Jesus, feed us, then our second prayer should be, Jesus, send us to feed others. You know, it's all about being and doing. Right, so G being fed by Jesus is about being with Jesus. It's about being in his presence and receiving our, our nourishment from him. We, we meet him on the beach, and he feeds us on his love. And you know, a lot of us can kind of get hung up on this stage because while being with Jesus sounds really easy, it's actually, um, it ends up being trickier than what we might think. Because we are trained doers, we do our job. We do our work. We fill up our calendars with things to do. And being doesn't always come easy to us. This is why sitting still and quiet in the presence of God is something that we have to learn. It is an art. We aren't used to just being. When I first started off in ministry, there, I met this, this older gentleman um, he was really involved in the community. Sometimes we would work together on things, be on the same committee and whatever, and serve in the food pantry together. And what I remember about him, one of the things I remember, apart from his wonderful dedication that he had to the service in the community and for the church, um, he, he uh, walked everywhere. He'd just walk all around town. And I would usually, it was a little town, I'd ride my bicycle. And, and I remember we were talking about this, and he said, I like walking. And I said, yeah, walking's too slow for me. So I, I like to bike so I can get to my destination faster because, you know, I've got a lot to do. And to which he responded, walking gives me time to pray. And at which point I realized I might be missing something. We have to learn to just be, right? To take the time to be present with Jesus. I think that's, the, that's our first lesson. And this is why Jesus meets those disciples on the beach. He wants to feed them. He wants to just be with them, share communion with them. And it's only after Jesus feeds the disciples that he says to Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And the second part is doing. We can't keep Jesus' love to ourselves. You know, he loves us. He's at work in us, but it's not just something for us. We have to get out there and we've got to, we've got to share it. Now, this is a spiritual thing, right? It's about feeding people's souls. It's instructing and counseling and comforting and forgiving. It's, it's bearing wrongs patiently. It's praying for people. It's all the things that the church has traditionally called the spiritual works of mercy. We feed people when we teach them through the, from the scriptures and when we point them back to Christ, the source of all sustenance. My guess is that you have experienced the, the taste of this spiritual food. Jesus said that his bread was to do the will of the Father. He said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Father. And I, I, bet, I bet that you have experienced this spiritual feeding. It's this moment where you hear a word from the scriptures or a word from a teaching or you read something powerful or someone just shows up in your life at the right time and, and gives you that word of comfort or word, that, their presence and it feeds your soul. It nourishes you. You know, this is one of the reasons that it's so important to memorize the scripture because when we have got those words kind of nestled down in our hearts we're able to bring them out and to, to have some nourishment to sustain us and to sustain others in times of need. We're able to pray through the words of Scripture. We discover our deepest hungers are for God and are met in God. But it's not just a spiritual thing. We feed the body too. You know, I, I like to tease our gardener friend, Dennis, um, you know, he loves to plant flowers. I bet you've seen some of his flowers in the, the hospital, the clinic, and the library around town and at Pine Village. Dennis loves to plant flowers, and I kind of mess with him, and I say, Dennis, I like flowers, but you can't eat flowers, right? You got to plant some veggies, and he says, you know, vegetables feed the body, but the beauty of flowers feeds the soul, right? So maybe you got to have both, right? Feed the body, feed the soul. 
But, you know, this is why we follow Jesus. This is why being his, this is, being his church is not just about spiritual things. It's about both, the, the soul and the body. It's about all the concrete ways that we live out our lives. To care for the soul is also to care for the body of others. This is why in his letter, James talks about faith and works. And he writes, if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? You know, you see this line of thinking that goes all the way back into the Old Testament. It's why you read in the scripture in, in one verse that you're to love the Lord your God, you're to worship God, you're to follow God, but then just a scant few verses later, you read about how you're to leave the edges of your field unharvested so that the poor can pick something. You're to use honest weights. You're to care for folks on the margins. Um, you know, faith in God immediately translates into concrete ways that we care for others. Jesus feeds us. We feed others, body and soul. And it runs even deeper than that. Feeding others is ultimately about overcoming the separation of sin that holds us back from truly loving God. Our tendency is to keep our, 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 keep our heads down, right? Protect ourselves, wall ourselves off from those in need. But Jesus keeps showing up on the other side of our walls. And Jesus keeps calling us to go to those who wait beyond the borders of what's comfortable for us. I think about that parable of the rich man and Lazarus that Jesus teaches in Luke 16. The rich man has it all. He lives in a nice house. He eats nice food. He is safe and secure. And yet just outside the gates of his house is Lazarus, a poor man with nothing but street dogs for companions. And here's the really terrifying part. When the rich man dies, and, and you know, he's not even given a name in that story. He's just defined by his wealth. When the rich man dies, he goes to hell. And Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham. And from hell, the rich man asks Abraham, Abraham to send Lazarus with a drop of water on his finger to touch to his tongue. But Abraham says it's not possible. And then the rich man asks Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his father and brothers. But Abraham says it won't do any good. They have the words of Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And if you know, they won't listen to the Bible, then it won't matter if someone rises from the dead and warns them. And you know, I hear that parable, and it cuts me to the heart, because I recognize myself as the rich man who ignores the distant Lazaruses of the world because of my own self-centeredness, because of willful ignorance or a sense of helplessness or whatever. Maybe some of you know that feeling. Lazarus is out there, crouched in the ruined cities of Yemen or hoeing at the sun-blasted dirt of South Sudan or knocking on the wall along our southern border, what do I do? Well, something. You know, it strikes me that when Jesus tells Peter, when Jesus tells the church to feed his sheep, he's telling him to do something. And sure, Peter won't be able to fix the world. He doesn't have to. It's not his world to fix. He's not the Messiah. But yet, Peter has a part. Peter has a calling. He has a moral commission. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And I think that's what we're called to. You know, we do this when we serve with MCC or, or we donate money to mission projects or we hand out boxes of food at the food pantry. We, we do this when we donate blood or we show up to help at the soup kitchen or we, we help the folks whose house burned down. I was struck last week had our annual meeting, right? And I was struck how each of our leadership teams had so much to report, right? And if you think about that, in the scheme of things, we are not a very big church, but throughout the year, here we are helping out families in need, supporting missions on other continents. We're, we're teaching kids. We're feeding kids. We're discipling children and adults in the way of Jesus. We're, we're doing a lot. And we're not just the ones who feed others. This is the thing we want to remember. It's not just about what we do. We shouldn't always think of ourselves as the hosts in this. Sometimes we are the guests too. We're the sheep. We show up and we are hungry, spiritually or physically or both, and we need Peter to feed us. We need Christ to feed us. Tomorrow is uh, 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And Dr. King was someone who had the uncanny ability to inspire people by feeding them on the bread of hope, the words of scripture, the vision of the prophets. He spoke a sustaining word into the soul of a hungry nation. But he always also had in mind the very real requirement to care for the physical sustenance of people. He drew attention to poverty and to racism and all the ways that, that people are kept from having what they need to thrive. In interpreting Jesus' words in the parable of the rich fool, that man who realized his land had produced much and who decided to build bigger barns and live out his days in comfort, when he interprets that parable, Dr. King describes how we are never truly independent, but in fact, we are all indebted to one another. And he writes this, Whether we realize it or not, each of us is eternally in the red. We are everlasting debtors to known and unknown men and women. We do not finish breakfast without being indebted to half the world. In a real sense, all life is interrelated. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. It's true that we're called to feed others. But so too, it's true that we are called to remember our dependence on others feeding us. We are fed by strangers and friends, parents and grandparents, the great cloud of witnesses that is the church down through the ages. And ultimately, we are fed the living bread of Christ himself. To be able to feed others is not just a requirement of our faith. It's a privilege an act of gratitude that flows from a deep-seated recognition that we have received much, and much more, in fact, than we deserve. And so we have the privilege of feeding others. The early Christian text called the Didache has this prayer for the Lord's Supper, and it goes like this. Almighty Master, you have created everything for the sake of your name, and you have given men food and drink to enjoy, that they may thank you. But to us, you have given spiritual food and drink and eternal life through Jesus, your child. Freely, Jesus has fed us. Freely, Jesus has sent us out. Do you love me more than these? Feed my sheep. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>